Dear Heavenly Father, thank you very much for gathering us here today for this class, Heavenly Father. Bless all those who are present here for this class, Heavenly Father. Lee is mighty, not understand your word, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, uh, bless uh, the man, Heavenly Father. Please help us to preach your word to us uh, with just as you could, Heavenly Father, and help us understand what you preach to Heavenly Father. And thank you very much for giving us all a chance here to attend our class, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so, should we first address any assignment issues, any questions that anyone had, or, yes. So, yeah, yes, okay, so the question was uh, for those online, it's when was the presentation going to be? So, based on who you've chosen, uh, I'll give you a date so that we are still following the same kind of order through Christian through the revival history. Uh, so I think we still don't have everyone's names in yet. I I think most people sent it in, but I'm I don't think we've got all. Uh, so I look at all the names today and then kind of give you all your dates. Also, is that there any link from which sources you can use the presentation? No, there isn't a limit. The my main thing was so I asked that you do a minimum of three resources. So those three resources can one can be the textbook. So that's the minimum. If you want to do more, you can do more. Uh, so I'm not sure if you all went into the rubrics and looked at what are the things I'm grading on. Do you know how to do that on Google Classroom? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So where the assignment is, there's also a small thing on the bottom saying rubrics. So if you Click on that, it'll tell you exactly what I'm looking for and how you'll be graded, all of those things. Okay, so um, most. Yeah, so those are the three main points, but then, okay. And so within that, I've also described what all I'm, what I'm looking for. Uh, Okay, let me just share screen I, just so that everyone is clear on this. I'll just show you all. Um, okay, so if you all go into this section and you open Yes, yes. So if you click on the uh, I'm sharing screen so if you all can look let me know if you all can see what I'm doing. See, I've opened the presentation instructions and all, and then there's a little button on the bottom saying rubric. Can you all see that? OK, so I, you all don't, is is rubric visible for you all? Okay, so there's like okay, so those are the I've shown you what exactly I'm looking for. Uh, thoroughness, thoroughness of research. So there is a scale there, depending on how many sources you'll use, uh, whether you'll have really grasped what that person's story is. And you'll have answered fully the question I've asked, which is their spiritual journey and uh, how they contributed to God's move in history. Uh, so if you'll fully answer those questions, then on timeliness is submitting your assignments on time, so each part of the assignment. And then the third is that your presentation is clear and logical, that you're covering all the content within the given time. So I've given you all five to seven minutes for presentation. So you all shouldn't exceed that time. You can also submit a uh, paper in addition to presenting in class. Yeah. Yeah, so that is uh, like, I want you to present in class, but if you feel like, I I communicate better in writing than in why when I'm speaking, then you can submit your paper separately. So your paper is just like to show the work that you've done. If you were not able to, uh, 
Yes, along with the presentation. Uh, if you are submitting a paper in addition to your presentation, it may help in case you feel like your paper uh, will do a better job of presenting whatever you research. It won't give you, I mean, it may help, yeah. So, really, uh, all short paper yes. Okay. So, I haven't actually mentioned that here, but uh, y'all can. You can do that. Okay, uh, so those are all the details. Uh, for those online, was everything clear in the instructions? Do you all have any questions? Okay, thank you, Anthony. Submitted and then there is a presentation date or like the presentation date will be a submission date. Yeah, the presentation date will be a submission date. So um, I will, I think we're only starting to present in September. So I'm, I think I'll give you all the dates by next week. But you can already be ready with your presentations just to have the specific date on which you'll present in class. You can uh, wait till next week. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, continue from where we stopped yesterday. Oh, one more question. Sorry. Huh? Yeah. So giving your sources, I mean, not just for this assignment, is very important when you're using sources to get your anything any like even if you are doing some research like whatever we're we're teaching all of that it's important to have the sources because it tells everybody else okay i've used sources that can be trusted so what i'm saying is well researched uh but it also allows now not in this specific uh, case but say you are teaching in us uh, in some setting and you give people resources if they want more information they can go back to those resources so you uh, citing your resources is very important when you're doing any kind of paper teaching all of those things okay okay so yesterday we um mostly finished covering Paul's first missionary journey. Um, so today we'll just finish that last part where Titus comes in towards the end of that journey and before they start on their second missionary journey. And then we'll go into Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, so like we mentioned, uh, Titus comes in and he is with Paul. So we uh, read in Galatians 2, just before Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem, uh, Titus is said to have gone with them when they go to Jerusalem. And this is between their first missionary journey and their second missionary journey. So Titus comes in somewhere in between. We don't know exactly how he gets connected to Paul and Barnabas. We don't know how he's become a believer. but. A, it is thought that he is also from the church in um, Antioch, where Paul was from. And so he is also from a Greek background. So we'll see later that uh, the thing about his circumcision also becomes something that uh, they talk about in Galatians. Uh, so I'll just uh, ask someone to read from Galatians 2, 1 to 3. I don't know if we read this yesterday in class, uh, but we'll just start from there. Galatians 2, 1 to 3. Then after, four, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Yeah, so here we see that Titus was of a Greek background, uh, so he's a Gentile. And the main question they were going to Jerusalem to answer is, do Gentiles need to be 
uh, circumcised uh, because there were some Jews who had started preaching that circumcision for Gentiles is necessary. Um, and so this is around AD 49 that they uh, travel to Jerusalem and they meet with some of the church leaders in Jerusalem, the apostles there, because they want this question answered by people in authority just to get that kind of assurance that, okay, what we've been preaching is true and what we've been saying is right. Um, so there's um, a good sign of accountability and uh, also having unity within the church, right? Although there was a local church in Antioch, there were several local churches, there was also unity within the church under the headship of the apostles and leaders in Jerusalem. Uh, so that is a good... Uh, now, we may not see that exactly played out in today's church in the way we do things, uh, but to ha always have that kind of accountability and other people, other leaders that you are... Uh, learning from and coming into agreement with just to make sure that you are not going on your own on your own track leading your church on your own thing there are other people uh, who you can trust who are also being led by the spirit who uh, will help you to stay on track with what is true and what is right um, so yeah they go up to Jerusalem and we see that Titus is was accepted without needing to be circumcised uh, so a few things from that discussion in jerusalem uh, we'll in acts 15 28 when they come to this conclusion they say okay not everyone needs to be circumcised uh, it says it seemed good to the holy spirit and to us so they're not making a decision just based on what seemed good to them they are still seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit in these decisions because these are all so new for them, right? There were no Gentile believers before. Before, if there were Gentiles coming into Ju Judaism, they would be circumcised. But this is a different kind of thing where they are coming to like faith in Christ and Jews naturally are already circumcised. So when they are coming to Christ, okay, they already have that kind of done. So these are big new questions that are arising within the church, things that have not had to be addressed before. And it's so important in these cases to say, like, we really need God's guidance in these things because we don't know, don't know what is uh, needed. And so that's uh, an example for us to follow as well. And uh, yeah, so then they go back to the church in Antioch. They share this and the Gentiles are very encouraged that, okay, these we're not going to be following all of these ritualistic things. Uh, we just have these main things. They give some few instructions. Those are the main things we need to follow. But there is a sense of freedom in this worship that we're following. We're not going to be following a set of rules. Uh, we're just going to be following Jesus. Uh, so let's go on from Acts 15.36, and that is the start of Paul's second missionary journey. Okay, so that is AD 49 to 52, a three-year period. Okay, from Acts 15.36 to Acts 18.22 is where the second missionary journey is covered. So it's a really long, like there's a lot more detail than the first missionary journey. So will take us, I think, at least two classes to finish, uh, but we'll start today. So Acts 15, 36, can someone read till the end of that chapter? Acts 15, 36. Uh, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us know uh, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Ba now Barnabas uh, was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them. The one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed. 
being commended by the brethren to the grace of God, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening this church, strengthening the churches. Okay. So right at the start of the second missionary journey, there's this big disagreement between Paul and Barnabas and Mark, right? All three of them went on the first missionary journey. But then uh, if you remember yesterday, we read at one point Mark left them, right? And Paul and Barnabas continued uh, together. So uh, obviously this upset Paul. We don't know exactly Mark's reason for leaving, but Paul feels that he left them in the middle of this mission that they were on. Uh, and so he doesn't want to take Mark with them, but Barnabas wants to take Mark. So Barnabas and Mark go on their own journey, and Paul takes Silas. Silas now had actually gone back with them from Jerusalem. When they went to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles, uh, Silas was one of the people who was sent by the apostles back with them to take that letter to the Gentiles. So Silas now joins Paul on the second missionary journey. Okay, but uh, some things that happened. So although this disagreement happened between Paul and Barnabas, we see in later on books that uh, somehow they had reconciled to each other. They didn't continue to be uh, angry or... Uh, in any way, like upset with one another. So in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, um, Paul refers to Barnabas and says, Do Barnabas and I have no right, uh, have no right to refrain from working, right? So there he's saying that both of us uh, are not receiving payment for the work that we are doing. So uh, in, he's aligning himself in a way with Barnabas. So that shows that there is some kind of uh, reconciliation between them. But with Mark, it's very clear that there is reconciliation. And what is beautiful uh, is that Mark is the one who is thought to have written the Gospel of Mark later on. So you see that restoration of Mark, even though whatever happened here, whatever he may have left them in the middle of the journey uh, for whatever reason, he does continue to be part of God's work and finally does like a very important role of writing that core gospel, which is thought to be the uh, gospel that Ma Matthew and Luke used when they were writing their accounts. So they used Mark's account, and then they added more stories on. OK, so uh, yeah, it's just beautiful to see that God, like whatever we may be, may be happening in us at this time, if we have failed in one way or another, doesn't mean, OK, that's the end of our usefulness to God or uh, work for God, that God can restore us and God can help us grow from whatever we have been to a place that maybe we would have never thought possible. Um, yeah, so a few places that Barnabas is mentioned. So there's Colossians 4.10. Um, it says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Uh, so he's showing his regard for Mark in this. And then uh, 2 Timothy 4.11 uh, says, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And then uh, later on in Philemon 1.23 and 24, uh, Mark is named as one of Paul's fellow laborers. So he's sending greetings, and he names Mark as one of the fellow laborers. Uh, and also Peter mentions Mark as well. And so uh, it's thought that Peter was the one who Mark got a lot of information uh, from about what Jesus had preached about and all of that that goes into the Gospel of Mark. So um, yeah, so Mark is restored. Barnabas and Paul are reconciled eventually. So whatever started here is not how things end. Uh, and so after that, Paul and Silas head out on this journey. We'll start reading from Acts 16. Um, can someone read? So we'll mostly do what we did yesterday, just looking at the scripture uh, account of their travels and what all happened as they were doing, they were on these journeys. I'll also share the second missionary journey map so we can. Yeah, you want to? 
in this when they are going in the second journey uh, paul accepted mark right ultimately i don't know if there's any record within the second missionary journey so all of the verses we looked at now are the ones where mark is mentioned later on in scripture so in acts there's no other record of mark uh yeah so second uh, timothy is where uh, timothy is writing right timothy writes with paul so that's at a later stage so that's not in the second missionary journey so uh, we don't know what in second missionary journey it just seems that paul and silas go uh, i don't think mark goes back with them because acts doesn't say anything and acts is our primary source for looking at the missionary journeys uh, so yeah. Okay, so this is a map of the second missionary journey. Um, so we'll have that open while we're reading from Acts 16. So Acts 16, 1 to 5. Can someone read from there? Acts chapter 16. One to five. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, whose and but whose father was a Greek. The brothers of Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Uh, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they believed the decisions reached by the apostles, apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in number. Okay, thank you. So we see here they start again from, I'm just looking at the map now. They start from Antioch, uh, where they had gone and spent a few years after the first journey. And then they go to, um, they go through Tarsus to Derby and to Lystra. So that's uh, their first stops. And uh, here is where Timothy joins them on the journey. So we now know that Timothy starts going with Paul and Silas onwards from here. Okay, so uh, Paul, although the leaders in Jerusalem said, okay, not all Gentiles need to be circumcised, Paul still chooses to circumcise um, Timothy just so that there will not be any hindrance to him uh, in the ministry as he's ministering to the Jews, right? So uh, that's an important thing to understand. Although there may be some rules that are not necessary, there are some things that are better to do just to avoid any unnecessary conflict that may arise. Um, and um, they go and they start to strengthen. So they already did this work in the first missionary journey. They went back to the uh, all of the churches that they had planted on their way back. And now they're doing a second round going to these churches to like check up on them. How are things going? Uh, what has been going on here? And to continue to strengthen them. So, uh, it's, so that last verse is really important. They were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. So this was not, this is something that we talked about, like revivals don't end in that season. So it was not that in my first missionary journey, God was moving in power. We planted the church and it is over now, right? Now they're going back after three years and the church is growing daily in numbers after three years. Um, so God is still moving in power in during the time that they are gone. But when they go back, God is continuing to move. Uh, that is an important thing for us to uh, understand about revivals and to expect when we are asking for a revival. Um, and the important thing of continuing to strengthen the work that was being done. So uh, it was because they were strengthening the faith of the believers that the church growth was happening. 
they uh, didn't just leave it at that one time that they went and preached the gospel. Uh, let's go on from verse 6 to 10. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to teach the word of God. After they had come to Syria, they tried to go into Bethania, but the Spirit did not permit them. So, passing by Messiah, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and greeted the vision, saying, Come over to me. Now, after he had seen the vision immediately, he sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel. Okay. What is that? Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry to those online. I'm not sure if um, you all missed that, but uh, we just read from verses um, 6 to 10 from Acts 16. Okay, so that is where Paul and now Silas and Timothy travel to. Okay, uh, so we see that Paul is taking, he when they initiated the journey, they said, okay, we're going to go to all of the churches that we had visited in our first journey. But they took a different route than they did the first time. And now they're going to different to new locations as the Holy Spirit is leading them. Okay, so they're going actually much further than they did in their first journey. And they're going through Asia Minor, they're going through Europe. Uh, so the second missionary journey actually covers a different path than that first journey that they were on. Um, so in this first uh, place, they travel. And uh, we see so many times that the Holy Spirit is leading them to a place. The Holy Spirit is stopping them from going to a certain place. Uh, and then that vision of somebody calling them to Macedonia. So uh, being led by the Spirit or being sensitive to the Spirit's leading as they are going on this journey. Uh, so while they left with a certain mindset, we're going to go to all the churches that we had visited on our first journey. Uh, as they are on that journey, they are still uh, praying and seeking the Holy Spirit's leading on that journey to go where He is leading, to know what is the work that God wants to do, what is the uh, what are the places in which God is already moving, so that we can go there and bring the gospel to those people because they're ready to receive it at this point. Okay, so uh, important to note that we have may may have our plans, but at the same time we're constantly seeking. Uh, God's guidance in those plans and willing to change our plans if God leads in a way that is different from what we were planning to do. Okay. Um, so they go from, okay, these are like a lot of places, but see, they, they mention Phrygia and Galatia, if you'll have your maps open. Right. So they went from uh, Derby, Lystra, and then they're in this region of Galatia. And then from there, they go to Phrygia, and then they go uh, through that through Mysia to Troas, right? And I think Troas is where we stopped. From there, he has the vision to go to Macedonia. So in this missionary journey also, Paul actually goes to some really big cities. So the next place where they go, Philippi, is one of the major cities in Macedonia. And then from there, they'll go on to Corinth. So they'll go to Athens, all really uh, big, important cities of that time. Uh, so also that is like spirit-led and strategic, right? They're going to places that are having impact, places where there are lots of people um, from different cultures. And so people uh, who encounter Jesus will then be able to impact whatever places they are from. Um, let's go on to verses 11 to 15. Uh, Acts chapter 16, 11 to 15. Therefore, sailing from we ran a straight 
us to Samothrace, and next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in the city of for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who met there. Now a certain woman named Lithia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Tithria, Tithira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Okay, so now uh, responding to that vision that they had, uh, that Paul had, they go across the sea from Troas through this island of Samothrace and then into uh, the Macedonian region. They go through Neapolis and then to Philippi. And it mentions that, that Philippi was one of the leading cities. So um, while while that vision said, come to Macedonia, it didn't say, come to Philippi in Macedonia, right? So they are led to Macedonia, but then the decision about where to go, we're not sure if uh, that was something that God clearly spoke to them. It's not mentioned here, but they chose a place uh, that was strategic, whether it was God uh, who specifically said that, or they just said, okay, we're going to Macedonia, let's go to a big city there. Um, but choosing wisely, if you're impacting a region, which what would be a key place to go to, to reach the most people. Um, and so they go there, they go to the place where they know people will be gathering for worship. Uh, so all of these things, like uh, while there is so much of like prayer and seeking the Lord and fasting and uh, depending on the Holy Spirit, there's also using your wisdom, using understanding, okay, people are going to be here, let's go to this place, uh, because we know they'll gather for worship there. Uh, and so you already know that those people are people who are seeking God, right? So if we go to them, they're probably going to want to listen to what we have to say. And so that's where we see that Lydia immediately responds to the gospel. Uh, and then um, she becomes a partner in the work that Paul is doing. Uh, now, as we read through what all happens in Philippi, we see that Paul actually reaches people from different parts of society. Like Lydia is a businesswoman, so she's uh, more like in the marketplace. Uh, in the next part, we'll read that he reached a jailer, right? So they, uh, they are imprisoned and... Um, they preach to the jailer's family and the jailer responds to the gospel. Uh, so similarly, we see that there are other people. Uh, there is another person who is an employee, I think, Acts 16, 27 to 34, uh, where we read. I'll just, can someone read from 27 to 34? The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he thought that the prisoners had escaped. So he pulled uh, pulled out his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted at the top of his voice, Don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for a light, rushed in, and fell trembling at the feet of Paul and Silas. Then he led, out, led them out and asked us, What must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord. Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your family. Then they preached the word of the Lord to him and to all the other, others in this house. At that very hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and he and all his family were baptized at once. Then he took Paul and Silas up to his house and gave them some food to eat. He and his family were filled with joy because they now believed in God. I you can go on till the end of the till, till the uh, you read till 34 right sorry till 34 ma'am okay so uh, so basically the jailer and his household are all saved so um, 
using every opportunity, right? I'm in jail. I'm going to preach to the people in jail. Uh, when I'm outside, when I'm free, then I can choose where to go and preach. So uh, preaching the gospel in season and out of season. Uh, so wherever there is always opportunity, but in those opportunities to also be seeking who are the people we should be speaking to, who are the people who God is leading us to um, in those times. Okay, let's go on to chapter 17, um, verses 1 to 9. Can someone read that? Chapter 17, verses 1 to 9. In Thessalonica, Paul and Silas traveled on through Amphil uh, Amphipolis and Apol Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue. According to his usual habit, Paul went to the synagogue there during three Sabbaths, he held discussions with the people, quoting and explaining the scriptures and proving the, from them that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from death. This Jesus, whom I announced to you, Paul said, is the Messiah. Some of them were convinced and joined Paul and Silas. So did many of the leading women and a large group of Greeks who worshipped God. But the Jews were jealous and gathered some of the uh, worthless loafers from the street and formed a mob. They set the whole city in an uproar and attacked the home of a man called Jason in an attempt to find Paul and Silas and bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city authorities and shouted, These men have caused trouble everywhere. Now they have come to our city and Jason has kept them in his house. They are all breaking the laws of the emperor, saying that there is another king whose name is Jesus. With these words, they threw the crowd and the city authorities into an uproar. The authorities made Jason and the others pay the required amount of money to be released and then let them go. Okay, so now they've left Philippi. So um, after they were imprisoned, they are let out of prison. So that is uh, actually their imprisonment is quite tough because they do undergo uh, like they are... Uh, they do undergo beatings, and then he uses his Roman citizenship to like demand why did they do that without questioning him. Uh, and then they are let go of, and they leave. Um, they leave from Philippi, go into Amphipolis, Apollonia, and then Thessalonica. And this whole account is in Thessalonica. So uh, the book of Thessalonians is written to this church that is established there. So we can also uh, look in Thessalonians. There are a few references to what happened when Paul went there. Uh, that is not in Acts. Okay. So First Thessalonians 1.5, um, if someone can read that. You can read 4 and 5 maybe. First Thessalonians 1, 4 and 5. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Yeah. That was verse 6 also. Okay. So, um, yeah, the when the Thessalonians received the gospel, it went to them with power not only with words but with the power of the holy spirit and with deep conviction so there was the work that paul was doing was filled with the holy spirit and the response of the people also was uh, that they were convicted by the holy spirit so we see that the holy spirit moved powerfully in this time in thessalonica and uh, and even in a, in acts it says a little bit some of the jews were persuaded uh, and some of the Greeks were also persuaded. But uh, here we see why they were persuaded, that the preaching came in power and the Holy Spirit was moving amongst them as well. Um, we also see about this time when Paul was in uh, Thessalonica that he was still working. So he was not only traveling and preaching the gospel, but he was also supporting himself through his work. Uh, so if someone can read First Thessalonians 2.9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. 
Okay, so here Paul is talking about the fact that he was also supporting himself uh, financially by working in addition to the preaching of the gospel. Uh, and we see in Philippians 4.16, uh, I'll just read uh, from Philippians 4.16. It says, For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. So apart from him working to support himself, there were other churches who were supporting the work he was doing. Uh, so uh, financially also, that is something to consider. right? Why, when we're going out and doing this work, uh, what are the ways we can also be covering the costs that are involved? Uh, are there ways we can look for work or be doing something simultaneously where we can be getting uh, the finances we need? Can we get the support of other churches? Um, are we going? Are we being sent by a church who is supporting us? Um, that is a very real thing to think about. It's not that, okay, we are just going to go out and believe God is going to provide and not think about finances at all. Well, Yes, we want to do that, but we also have to think about what can I be doing? Or are there ways in which I can be uh, getting the support I need so that the work goes on unhindered? Right? The main point is we need to continue this work. And the if we have the finances to do it, then we'll be able to continue it without worrying about how, how will we do the work. Right? So that's a practical, real need that we should be thinking about. Um, so from here, Paul and Silas, okay, we have a few minutes, so we can just read this next passage, uh, verses 10 to 15. This is where they enter uh, Berea, and I'm sure all of us have heard of the Berean Christians, so we'll just read that part. Uh, which one? Uh, 10 to 15 of Acts 16, Acts 17, sorry. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. But both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Okay, so um, so Paul and Silas leave again because of the persecution that they... So in each place, the, what is moving them from one place to another is the opposition that they're facing. Okay, so the first one was being jailed, and from there they move to this place, and then there's persecution, there's opposition that's coming in. So from here, uh, from Thessalonica, they move to Berea. Um, and we see the same thing that we saw on the first missionary journey of Jews from the previous place, following them to the next place to cause trouble for them. Uh, but they are continuing the work, no matter what uh, is happening, whatever challenges they're facing, whether they have to move, whatever they have to do, they keep doing it and they keep continuing the work uh, that is going on, that they're doing. Um, and anything important here from this passage? Yeah, so th at this point, because of that opposition is where there's a split that happens, where Silas and Timothy stay in Berea, and then Paul moves on to Athens. Uh, and now Athens was a very big, very important uh, city of that day. Um, and Athens was actually the center for uh, philosophy. Like all of these famous philosophers, uh, there's a whole list of philosophers here who are named, who are from Athens. So it was known for intellectual thinking, for discussing uh, ideas and being able to uh, prove your point, 
through the use of logic, all of those things. Uh, so the people who are from here, there's Socrates, there's Aristotle, uh, Demosthenes, there's Plato who studied, um, I don't know, there's Aristotle who studied in Plato's academy. So all of these people, so uh, a place really um, of education, of philosophy, of thinking, of all of that. So he goes there and his method has to match the place that he's preaching in, right? So in each place that he's going to, he's preaching to, we see here he always went to the synagogue, he always preached to the Jews. There were also Greeks who were responding to the gospel. Uh, I think these Greeks may have been in the synagogues because they're there's no mention of him going anywhere else um, other than the synagogue. So here um, he goes to the people in the marketplace. He goes to the philosophers and where they are, and he'll start to preach to them. OK. Uh, and there were two major streams of thought among the philosophers in Athens. So there were the Epicureans and there were the Stoics. OK, so the Epicureans. Uh, they believe that whatever happens, happens by chance. Uh, on the other hand, the Stoics believe that everything that happens is the will of God. Okay, so there are completely opposite views. Uh, Epicureans viewed that death was the end of everything. Uh, Stoics viewed that, uh, that the world collapsed and would restart every now and then. There would be a full destruction of the earth. And then there would be a restarting of the earth, and everything would uh, start from the beginning. So that uh, view of a cyclic kind of time. Uh, and then uh, Epicureans saw, thought that gods were remote from the world. They were not connected to what happens in the world, and they didn't care about what happens in the world. Uh, but on the other hand, Stoics thought that, um, that God was in everything, that every person had a part of God in them. So we'll uh, read a little bit more about that. Um, and then Epicureans believed that pleasure was the chief, like our chief goal in life is seeking pleasure. So that's all we should be going after. Uh, now the Stoics, um, they believed, OK, so they, it was started by somebody who was actually uh, a contemporary with Epicurus who started Epicureanism, OK? so. When you're looking at the differences, it's almost like this is a response to what the Epicureans were stating. So if the Epicureans believed one thing, the Stoics went on the other extreme and believed something else that was on the opposite side. OK, so some main things about the Stoics that we haven't uh, covered is that they believed everything was God, that God was a fiery spirit, and that uh, we have life, all people have life, because a part of that spirit is in us. And when we die, that spirit returns to God. Part of that fiery spirit returns to God. Um, the, everything else we covered. So we look a little more at Athens and then what happens in Athens when we come back next week. OK, thank you. Thank you to all those online as well.